right, welcome back everyone to another episode of Marketing Con Queso. And in this episode, we're talking about systems. We're talking about how you can systemize your success we're going to get a little geeky in this episode. I brought in my wife, the better half of I Am Scalable, for this, this episode because she is the COO of our company and she handles all of our systems and checklists and processes and all those things. I'm really just in charge of sales and marketing, and so she keeps the whole train on track. And uh, so we're going to, me and Michelle and Shauna, we're all going to show you guys what systems we use in our business to make sure that we stay focused, we stay productive, and we stay growing, and as well as to measure uh, our progress along the way. So it's going to be a fun episode, and this is a really important topic, so uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be sharing this with you guys. Michelle, take it away with the reviews. First off, uh, Shauna, I'm so excited to have you on board because we always hear from Justin about how Y'all run your business, but um, I think that you'll have some really cool stuff to share with us that we haven't heard before. So, uh, and not just you know embarrassing stuff about Justin, but like some actually really <laughs> cool stuff. So I'm excited. Uh, Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So okay, for a review this week, we've got Robo Dabo from the U.S. who said that we are an awesome and informative duo trio this week. Um, Michelle and Justin provide the straight goods from a business point of view. Not only do I find them informative and their show notes helpful, they are funny and entertaining on subjects that can be a bit dry. Glad to be able to see the Princess of Petaluma and Justin regularly rock it. Um, first time I've been called that. I take what I can get. So thank you. Appreciate the review as a whole, Robo Dabo. And for those folks listening, head on over to iTunes, type in Marketing Con Queso, and let us know what you think of the show. Robo Dabo thinks that we were worthy of five stars. What do you think? All right, so this week we're talking about systems. And the reason why I want to talk about systems is when I first started this business, one, uh, all I really wanted was a website that paid my bills. And eventually I got that, even though people thought that that was ridiculous and you know not possible and whatever, I did get that. But then you get to a point where you realize this really isn't a business. I'm kind of winging it every day. And you know, really, like any anything serious that were to go wrong, like everything shut down, and this is really a sellable asset and stuff like that. And and I got to a point where I was stuck at the same revenue point for five years in a row, and I'm just like, man, why am I stuck? I can't grow anymore. And the problem was, is I just didn't have systems in my business. So we hired a business coach, and the business coach taught us a lot about. Uh, big business systems. I mean, systems that Radio Shack uses, AT&T uses, and my wife is going to talk about some of those systems and how we use them. And, you know, it, it really all starts with, you know, what do you want to accomplish? And, and I know we hear about this all the time from all the experts. You know, they, you, you got to be specific in your goals and you got to have a goal, but it really does start with what is your goal? And then my wife is going to explain how you can take that goal, which we call our primary aim, and then you create a strategic plan to achieve that goal, and then you create position contracts from the strategic plan, and then from the position contracts you create checklists, and it backs all the way up to reaching your primary aim. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, Michelle, you also have a lot of systems, and I saw a post from you the other day where you literally just shared a screenshot of one of your, I guess it was one of your base camp, or I think you used Teamwork PM. You know, what kind of systems do you use in your business, and, and how, do you, what do you feel, how do you feel about systems? Yeah, so a lot of what we do is based on recurring task uh, templates. You're muted. Oh, am I in now? I hear. Justin? <laughs> Justin does not appear to be able to hear me. Last week. Shauna, can you, you hear, hear me? me? I can hear Michelle. And yeah, Justin. I can hear Shauna. It's just us. <laughs> so Justin's out. It's a me and you podcast. Exactly, today. yeah. <laughs> and he has no clues we're saying anything about him. Oh. 
<laughs> oh, this is awesome. Maybe he's not getting the sound feed, because clearly it's working. Maybe somebody can... Uh... Right, I, I, I get it. You guys can hear each other. I can see that, like the lips moving back and forth. Um, I can't hear any of you. Ask him if he can come in here I'll, with me, because he's you only guys, in the next Michelle, room. Go ahead and start off with your systems. I'll pop out and come back in. Okay, I'm gonna clap for the for the good audio. YouTube listeners will get this though. So, yay. Okay, so systems. Um, so yeah, we use Teamwork PM, and a lot of what we do in our business is based on recurring task templates, and that's because there's certain things that we do regularly over and over again, whether it's for our own business or for our clients. And for example, the one that I shared the other day was a screenshot of our. Um, podcast production and pushing out uh, process. So I don't know, it's like 15 steps because the process is such a pain in the butt. And there's always like, oh, you got to change this photo and, you know, thumbnails over here and featured images over here. So there's a lot to remember and that's why we created a process out of it. Using a system like Teamwork PM, and there's a bunch that'll do this, but that's the one that we like, I'm able to say, to the team, oh, okay, you know, we need to um, put out another podcast episode. It'll load the template for me. It'll populate it with who does each task. It'll populate it even with when those tasks are due. And then the team goes out and gets the work. So, like for our client stuff, you know, if we are doing somebody's social media, a writer will be assigned to write it every week on a recurring basis. And then nobody ever has to go in and say, oh yeah, aren't we supposed to write for so-and-so again? Because that would be a really big problem because we would never remember off the top of our heads everything that we're supposed to do for all of our clients and our own business. So for me, um, and in my business, recurring tasks and then using task templates and having a system that we all like that does that, and for us that's Teamwork PM, has been essential in making things run and getting stuff where it's in one system that everybody can see at once because if it's all up here in my brain then people are asking me all the time what to do and um, inevitably somebody will make big big mistakes so that not only that but then they're always reliant on you exactly and they're like you know Michelle what am I supposed to do here and I'm like figure it out we put it in task templates and then nobody asks me anything <laughs> so how do you how do you come up with your task templates like how do you know I think that's going to be one problem for people starting out with systems is well like I don't even really know what to do so how can I create a system of what to do how did you come up with your your processes and stuff like that and maybe where can we borrow some stuff like that hmm I think that a lot of the things that that end up being task templates for me are things that I realize I'm doing over and over again and that I don't like doing or they aren't the best use of my time and so I need to then think about how I can get somebody else to do this what parts of it can somebody else do and so I will document what I do I'll have in one screen let's say let's use this podcast example again I'll have one screen open with um, my doing the actual work of putting out a podcast and then I'll have another window open with the task template in Teamwork PM and then I will add each step as I go along and in the beginning you know it might be too much to say to my team oh, okay well here's the task template go do all 15 steps because some things require more thought some things are more complicated than others but I can start them off with with five of those 15 steps and then maybe I'll keep doing the other bits and then the next week I'll give them a few more next week I'll give them a few more so that's one of the ways that we um, get things off of my plate and onto their plate and that does of course require that I know what I'm doing for that particular task too which um, I think is like another level of, of business is when you start to get to the point to where you don't even know how things are done and your team is the one creating the task templates. Have you guys had any experience with that? Definitely. I'm working on checklists for positions I don't handle anymore. But because I want to duplicate that role again, I have to create checklists so I can hire another person. And so 
the other day, you know, I created what I thought the steps were, handed it off to the employee, and said, here is this accurate. And then he came back to me with one that was like two or three pages longer than what I had created because there were just more resources or more clicks on the screen because, you know, we do ad management. So, you know, if the Facebook power editor changes, if Facebook moves a button from this tab to that tab, if, you know, so he had just modified an older checklist that I had created and I thought was accurate and then just the steps just branched out from there so I definitely see that a lot of the checklists and one of the things I was going to point out is like your checklists are never done because it's just yeah. always going to grow like the podcast one you know we have a front of one side of the podcast and you have the other side of the podcast but they're two completely different checklists and I'm constantly updating our checklist so that I, I can make our system better you know, I'll send her another resource that tells her, you know, like, you know, here's how we're adding the the show notes now, or here's how we're adding the YouTube into the show notes now that they've added YouTube. And so the checklist from when you guys first started the podcast is morphed into a completely different checklist now. So, so how do you get then your your people, your staff members to identify that something has changed with the process and then update it for you? Or are you coming to them and saying, like you did with the one recently, um, I've got this, is this correct? If not, let me know. Right. Most of the time, if I know a change is going to happen, I'll pull up the checklist that is current for that task and see where does this change happen. And then if it's too in-depth for my technical skill, you know, but whether it's programming or more in-depth ad knowledge, I'll ask them to fill in that blank. But if I can find a resource that already has a training, then I give them that training. So when you guys added YouTube, I went and found a plugin for the WordPress site that added YouTube links and just told her, you know, this is how you're going to add the YouTube video in every week. And so she didn't have to learn a lot. I went and did it for her. But I could have handed it off to somebody else to go find the plugin and find the best opportunity. But it only took me 15, 20 minutes. So I think it varies depending on how difficult it's going to be for me to hand off to somebody. Yeah, I want to jump in here real quick and talk a little bit about some, uh, some mindset stuff. My image isn't coming up. Is it coming up for you guys? It is. OK, all right. I just want to make sure everybody else is seeing it. So. Um, one of the things that I think is so important about systems is, you know, when I was winging it, there's really no way to measure what you were doing. So if you do something wrong, you pretty much have to do it all over again you, it, because you don't really know where it went wrong. But when you have, even if it's a bad checklist, even if the checklist doesn't have every step in there, you at least there's a couple of steps so you can say okay well maybe I don't have to redo it the whole thing I can just change this part or change that part and that's why the the checklists are always growing is because you're always like like you guys said you're always trying to evolve on what you're doing make the process better make it more efficient take steps out that aren't working and that's that's huge for somebody to really realize is you know, one, the checklists help you to not have to think about what you're doing every time, but they also help you when you, you know, when you get a bad result, you can then look at the system and see, okay, here's where it went wrong. If we just change that step, now it won't be wrong ever again because we, we've removed that, that bad part of the system. And that's, that's what's really been huge for us in growing. Another thing I think that checklists do for you is they add so much value to hand, to your business. You know, the podcast, we don't set up new podcasts every week. You know, we're not running, you know, 18 different podcasts at a time. But, you know, if if the opportunity comes along that we need a new podcast or maybe one of our clients wants to run a podcast or our business partners, like instead of having to go back and rethink through how do I submit it to iTunes, how do I get it on YouTube, how, what's the best way to record it, how do I set it up on WordPress, things like that, like having that checklist, I don't have to think through again. I can just search through my Google Drive, find the check the setup the podcast setup checklist, and now I just have to work through the steps. And now granted some of the steps may be outdated and I might have to tweak them just a touch, but I don't have to think through what plugins I needed, what processes I needed, what links I needed. It's all there and the problem's already solved. So you just have to duplicate the process again. It's not it's just so much more valuable the next time for saving your time. 
So tell me how you get over the hump, because I was just reading in um, Internet Marketing Super Friends, somebody was saying, how do I do X, Y, Z? And the first answer, or how do I how do I get my you know staff to do X Y Z? And the first response was, you don't. You do it yourself because you can never get somebody to do work as good as you can. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and I think that you know, like we've all been there. Like we've all had that thought where you know you try to pass something off to somebody, you try to systemize it, and then it just goes completely haywire. So how do you kind of get over that hump? of um, at least in your own mind or in actual practice of, of getting those things systemized and off to somebody else and packaged the way that they should be. One, one, say... one, thing, be, one thing before you, you start, Sean, I know you're going to have a great answer here. I just want one <laughs> little thing. Um, we've started, whenever you hire someone, whether it's an outsourcer or you, someone in-house, you're hiring them for a position and I'm going to say that if you're hiring them for a position, they should know how to do that position already. So if I'm hiring a video editor or if I'm hiring uh, a banner designer, you know, we ask them to create a checklist after they're done the work. You know, we ask our employees to create the checklist for us. That way we don't have to. And it's just another step that if I were to ever hire an outsourcer again, I would just pay a little bit extra and say, when you're done with that, can you create a checklist for me as well? And then I'll have that checklist going forward. So go ahead, Sean. I was going to say there's a couple of criteria I have for getting it as close to. First, I accepted that it's not ever going to be my way 100% because they're not me. That's it's just taken for granted. I have seven years of owning a business and running a business knowledge myself, so I pull from all of my experiences and there's no way that person is going to have the same knowledge and the same experience to output it the exact same way. So the first thing I start with is what do I want the end result to be? And then I can backtrack, you know, what are the steps they're going to need to get to that result? And then from the steps I can say, well, what knowledge are they going to need? And so if I happen to have a training, I would tell them, I learned this in this training. And then they can watch the training to get as close to the knowledge that I already have on the topic. Um, after I create a checklist, if I'm still not getting the output I want, or if it's not, you know, 98% what I want, then I'll go through and see, you know, where in this process is, is, the, is the system breaking to not get the outcome I want, and then find a resource. So at the bottom of every checklist I have in the business, there's an additional resources section, and I add in extra links to training videos, links to blog articles, you know, that just give them the extra bit of knowledge that might help them get closer to the knowledge I might have over them. And you then know, I, I was just going to say, also, when we hire somebody, every line item starts with be responsible for which means they're responsible for finding the solution that gets as close to mine. And that also eliminates me from having to always tell them, here's how to do it. I say, you know, you're responsible for that. I'm sure there are resources, support groups, support help, you know, all kinds of places that you can go to before you come to me for the solution. And so that just those three words, when I hire them, makes them responsible for finding that solution in case my solution wasn't spot on. So... I want to talk about I want to talk about a little bit of a, a case study uh, of of how that actually happened to us. One of our one of our employees we we moved her from the uh, like office assistant role to the social media manager role, and she wasn't really a social media manager, so she kind of had to like learn un under the fire. And so at first we were like, okay, well this fan page is about women's weight loss and fitness. So post about women's weight loss and fitness stuff. And for the first week, I was constantly going back and deleting the posts because I was like, no, those are wrong. And that's that's me wanting it done my way. And you know, it wasn't done perfectly to my way, so I was deleting it. I was like, and then so Shauna helped me out a little bit and said, okay, well what you know, what kind of posts would you like to see? And I was like, well, okay, well, here's the 12 different types of posts that I would normally post. There's funny ones, serious ones, educational ones, recipes, you know, you know whatever. So now, instead of the checklist changed from post to this fan page 
twice a day to post these types of posts uh, twice a day to the fan page. And then she started doing it again, and I didn't like some of the articles that she was sharing. And so Shauna said, well, what articles do you approve of? What blogs? And so then we created a, a, another item in the checklist that said, make sure when you're pulling an article, pull from these blogs. And so we created a little feed lead channel for her of blogs just for that spot. So that's how, you know, in the beginning, yeah, the person didn't know how to do it my way and they didn't get my result. But then we built a system step by step to make sure that it was getting my way, you know, at one point at a time. I, I hope that made sense. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give the folks some examples of, of other things that we've systemized in our businesses. So I'll give uh, one. When somebody orders our service, they are automatically directed to a questionnaire that asks them a little bit about their business so that we can understand who our new client is. That questionnaire automatically goes to Zendesk where a ticket is opened, where the team is alerted, and then the team goes, you know, um, into our, actually into our Teamwork PM system and sets up the new client's project. And then also in Zendesk, there is all of the replies that we send to clients throughout the setup process. So the first one that goes out for like a new um, social media client says, you know, oh, you need to add us to your Google Plus page managers. Here's how. You need to add us to your Facebook page managers. Here's how. And so we don't rewrite that email every time, whether it's me or whether it's a staff member or whether it's, you know, I don't know, monkeys. Nobody's rewriting this stuff and redoing it. Um, so we're using the macros in Zendesk to have it so that once a person purchases, they immediately get some kind of feedback. Yes, that was received. Something is happening on your order. Um, because unlike a product like an ebook, there's no instant download for a service, right? So it was really important to me that like they knew that their order went somewhere and that something was happening on it, even if at that very moment our staff was asleep or something since we are all global these days. Um, and, and part of how we're doing that is with that automation so that things go directly into Zendesk and then Zendesk automatically produces replies with its macros. Um, do you guys have anything like that kind of setup that, that's auto <clears throat> automation? Um, yeah, for your I, am, I loved your system. I actually purchased your product and we're a member, but um, I loved that system as I was going through it. I was like, man, I should be using that tool instead. For our system, we have, well, we have phone sales. So it's a little bit different. So Justin will say, you know, Sean's going to send you a proposal. And so then from there, he goes and fills out a job form, which gives me all of the client's information that he talked to on the phone. And that comes to my email. I create the the proposal for them and I send it with a specific subject line every time so then when they hit a reply when they hit reply and send me back the signed proposal then my my gmail I have a filter set up that says hey I just wanted to say I received this and I'll send you um, I'll get your project set up shortly and so it's just very simple, just confirming that I received it for the same purpose as they would say, you know, if I had waited four hours to respond to that email, they'd be like, did you get this? I'm ready to go. Did you get this? And so yeah. it just confirms that, yes, I got it, and I'll get it set up soon. It doesn't, like, give them a deadline, but normally I do it within 24 hours. And then once I receive that proposal, I go into Basecamp, which I know you're using uh, Teamwork PM because of the recurring, but with Basecamp, I have preset templates as well for each of our services. So if their service is a little, each service just has a few different tasks. And so then I just hit, you know, start this service and it pre-populates with all of the tasks for the service from everything from how do I process their, uh, how do I process their invoice to how do I send them the first getting started email which tracks which asks for all the information I need to get their campaign set up. And then it even sets up my team with the tasks they're going to have over the next three days. And then, you know, the next day I come into the office, open up Basecamp, and just run through those tasks. And that makes sure that the money is tracked inside our pro forma, that the client is tracked inside of um, Basecamp, and the employees know what tasks they have to do. And then it even gives us every email we have to send out, pre-commented out, where they can just copy and paste it and send it on the deadline for when it's due. And, 
So I have a very similar system, but I'm not using, um, what is that, Zendesk? But I think I might consider switching over because I really like that system you had set up. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's having everything. The biggest thing is having those templates written somewhere. You know, yes. so wherever you put them, as long as it works for your, for your team, awesome. But like rewriting them over and over and over again is mind numbing. Yes, and the here's how is really important, especially when you're doing a service for a client because a lot of them like you some of them may know how to do what you're asking them to do, but it's so much easier if you can say, you know, I need links to your entire URL and your entire funnel, and then I also need you to give me access to your Facebook Ads Manager and your Facebook fan page, and most of them are like, I don't know how to give somebody else access. Why am I giving you access? You know, what is that going to do on my end? And so all I do is I say, here's how to do that. And it's just a link to a short screencast video that explains how to do it, and then I always answer why we do it. And then also, I'll reaffirm, like, if I'm asking them to give me, Justin, and one of our own team members access, I say, I tell them who those team members are because it gives them a sense of security, especially since we're dealing with somebody's money. You know, like, they want to know, why am I giving this random person access to my ad account? And I tell them, you know, he's our trusted guy. He runs all of our ads, and it just gives them the added security when you bring them on. Mm -hmm. So... And it's often important. so much better, too, if you can answer questions before they verbalize them. Mm. Yes. Good point. Good point. We actually, when we were going through, when we were onboarding clients, we'd get the same questions, and Justin and I just finished creating a series of educational videos that as soon as they um, submit for a quote from us, it sends them a three-part video series that explains, you know, what is our process for running ads? Um, why do you ask for an ad budget minimum? Why do I have to X, Y, and Z? And so we just address those in short two-minute YouTube videos that are animated. And I sit and they go, go out to it in an email series that says, hey, I, I know you really want to get started on your ads today, but here's a quick two-minute video that explains the process we're doing right now behind the scenes. And That's it just a really runs cool through system that. for, yeah, like pre-answering questions that people will have. I love that. Well, I realized in, in my sales calls that there were, you know, basically three objections that everybody had. And every sales call I was having to, you know, counter or rebuttal these objections. So that's, that's instead of having to repeat myself over and over again, you know, that's when you realize a, a system needs to be created here. And so that's when we created a couple of videos that were fun. They were you know, animated. Um, we got, you know, I wrote the scripts for them in like a southern female voice. Yeah, it uses Darlin and Sweetie and stuff like that. And, um, and then we, and we got a, a voiceover for it. But basically, instead of me having to overcome these objections in my sales calls, now as soon as somebody signs up, before they even get on a sales call with me, they're getting videos that explain our service, um, you know, why we have this thing in place, why we have that thing in place. And now when I get on the sales call, it's so much easier for me to close the sale because I don't have to overcome those objections again. I don't have to rethink of that. I can just refer back to the video and say, well, you remember in this video, this is why we have this process in place. And, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. That's why you do that. And Not only that, I think it builds trust um, ahead of time because then they can say, oh, well, they already have a system for that. And, oh, I really like that system for that. And that makes sense. And so ahead, before they're even on the call with you or even a team, a part of your client roster, they they already know your system ahead of time, and I think that just gives them that little bit of trust when they're on the phone to say, yeah, I'm ready for this. Yeah, and that's a really good illustration, too, of using systems not just to get the, the work done, but to get the work to come in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. To make those sales, you know, like that's super important. Um, I have, you know, on, on our, like, sales website, you know, I have an FAQ page, but still the stuff that we get at our support desk, people writing in, are the same questions that are answered on the FAQ page. That's why I put them on the FAQ page. But clearly, uh, you know, some people don't like to read that extent of information, so I love your video idea. That's fantastic, and I bet you that that would um, reduce people with those questions if we had something like that in my business. 
I actually, yeah, I actually just outlined the next system. So we have an onboard, like, once they submit for a quote, that series happens. And But once they sign their proposal, there's still more information that they ask us. And so I just created a two-week follow-up series that says, hey, today we're going to be doing X, Y, and Z for your project. And then in the PS, I'm giving them just a little bit more information of what's going to happen later in the week. So that way they feel that they know what's happening in their account, even though we're not talking to them every day. And they know it's an automated series. Like, it'll say, hey, over the next few days, you're going to be receiving these emails from me. But they're just explaining what we're doing behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And then each one takes them a step further and then gives them more information, you know, like further down the line, in order to scale your campaigns, you're going to need to know these metrics. Are you tracking these metrics? Here's a really cool video training that Justin did two years ago or, you know, last month on an interview, and it teaches you how to track these metrics. And so all I did was use a lot of the questions that they were already having, and I just build value there and give them some added bonus tips. And then they're like, oh, I really like that email. And then they stop asking us questions because they're involved in that autoresponder series. So that's something I'm in the process. I don't have the full 12 weeks up there yet, but I have the first five, and it seems to be going well so far. That's awesome. I'm, I'm taking notes because we need that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one second here. We've been talking for quite a bit, and I know we're all having a lot of fun here. I, I do want to make sure that we cover the part of how we go from our goal, like what we want to do, to having a plan for that, to having you know, what we call position contracts, to having checklists. Um, so I wanted to have Sean talk a little bit about that. Uh, Michelle, did you have anything... Uh, and any other points you want to jump in on before? No, I'm all ears. Give it to us, okay. Shauna. Cool. All right. Cool. So we have what's called a primary aim, and it's really here. I'll just, I think I have, one, I have one printed out that I'm trying to get blown up, but um, I'm blowing it up into a poster so that way everyone that walks into the office, it's there and it's constant in our mind. And really, all it covers is, you know, by the end of this quarter, our business is going to earn this much in revenue, and in order to in to reach that revenue goal, we're going to do that by selling X, Y, and Z services. And then from there, it, it goes through our values. You know, we're going to do this in our eight-step business plan. And so um, from that primary aim, behind the scenes, we have a business development plan, which is, like it says, an eight-step plan. It just talks about some of the values we have in our core business. And then Justin has created this marketing plan for our business. And between the two of those, we create what's called a strategic plan for the quarter. And the strategic plan outlines everything we have to do in order to earn the amount we put on our primary aim. So, you know, for one quarter when we were first getting started, you know, it was $50,000 in a quarter. And the next quarter it was, you know, $80,000. But in every time you're trying to grow your revenue, the tasks to achieve that revenue are going to change. And so that's how I create the strategic plan. What are the tasks we have to do in order to achieve that goal? And the strategic plan goes through um, what the account manager has to do, how many sales does he have to make of each product in order to reach that goal, what does our social media manager have to do in order to make sure that our brand is communicating with the public to bring have inbound clients and leads coming in? What does our COO have to do in order to make sure all of our systems are running effectively and we're delivering for our clients? So you pretty much break down everything each role in our company has to do in order for us to earn X dollars per quarter. All right. One thing I want to jump in real quick here that I really like that our business coach showed us is, you know, even even when it was just me and Sean, you know, before we had any employees, uh, you know, he helped us, you know, get to the point where we have employees. Before that, uh, it was just us, and he had us create an organizational chart. And yes, I w I am the CEO and the CMO and the account manager and the the garbage taker outer and you know what <laughs> what whatever, but. People need to start thinking about their business as in that there are these roles. You are not supposed to be the person doing all of these things forever and ever. So create the roles, even though it's all you. Once you create the roles, then you can say, okay, well, the CMO is going to do this, and this person is going to do this, and then eventually you can say, okay, well, I've, I'm, I'm doing a little bit better now. I can maybe find 
uh, enough time to hire somebody part-time for this one role. And that's how you slowly start being able to step away from your business is by having those roles defined and, have, and knowing what each of those roles is doing. You can start you know, plugging one person in at a time. You know, me and Shauna, we started with just us. And then we added on Ashley, and then we added, you know, we had Nat and Eileen and Joey, and you know, it just starts a little bit by a little bit. They they start working through those roles. So I'd really like to see people, if you're a solo entrepreneur, to stop really. I don't really dig that word, the solo entrepreneur thing. I think that if you want to build, what about mediapreneur? Uh, I love David, so I'm not I'm not gonna rip on that one. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's a cool word and everything, and I get it. We want to build lifestyle businesses, and we, you know, we're proud of being a solo entrepreneur and all that. But I think you should be trying to be building something bigger than yourself. I think you should be trying to leave a lasting dent in the world. And to do that, you're going to need to be build a bigger business than a solo entrepreneur. And I think you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the world, you owe it to your customers to really start thinking about your business in that big business sense of things and just start creating an organizational chart. Even if you have every position under there, just start thinking about what those roles would be, what those roles would be doing, and start creating checklists for those roles because eventually you'll start plugging a person into each one of them. Before you know it, you're managing the whole thing and you're not doing any of the work anymore. And yeah, I really, really like that. It's not Michelle does X, Y, Z. It's that the CEO does this. The marketing manager does this. That's a big mindset shift. Thank you for that. I was just going to say, it's not just that you're creating the roles, it's that you're supposed to put on different hats. I, that's how I picture it anyways. You're supposed to put on a different hat for each role, which requires a different skill level. You know, when I hired Ashley, I would never ask her to do what the CO, CFO does. She can't handle payroll and invoicing and proposals and processing credit cards from day one, but like she can work up to that role. And so when you divide out all the tasks you do and then give them to a person that's responsible in the, even if that's still the same person, um, it lets you be able to see, okay, well, the first person we can replace is this assistant role who's going to help us here and here. And then I can hire a social media person who's going to manage our social media pages. And then I can hire an ads manager who knows advertising and marketing and copywriting to handle that. And so you can chunk it out by skill as well so that you're hiring the right person for the right task. And I think that's a lot of times the problem people have when they're trying to hire is they're like, well, I don't like to do this thing. I'm doing it over and over again. So I made this checklist, and I'm just going to hire some person overseas because somebody told me it was cheaper. But like, they're not looking at the skill set required to achieve the goal they want. And I think that that's something you have to Did look at. Did somebody just into. steal your car, Michelle? I hope not. <laughs> it, it's, it's I hear an alarm going off. Is that over by you? Oh, it just stopped. Just stopped. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> so that's, that's definitely a great point. I'm glad you broke that out. We have 11 roles, technically, on our strategic plan. And it goes from my programmer and designer, uh, a customer support assistant, an in-office assistant, who are two different people. The in-office assistant also does our social media management. So she has two roles, technically, because they're two people I could hire for. Um, the marketing coordinator and account manager, the CFO, the CMO, the COO, and the CEO. And I think that was 11, at least I hope so anyway. And like Justin and I wear all the officers hats. We're still doing all that work because that's our role, but we can slowly hire up as we grow. Um, so from the strategic plan, what? Uh, no, the cat was going cat. crazy. <laughs> Um, okay, so you were talking about how we go from the primary aim, and, and I want to talk a little bit about how the primary aim is created. You you say, I want to make $5,000 a month or 10000 Maybe it's, I want to make a million dollars a month. Okay, fine, cool. Your goal is your goal. Whatever, you know, how are you going to do that? You're going to have to sell something to make that money. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to sell cars. You know, and okay, well, what kind of cars are you going to sell? I'm going to sell, 
you know, race cars to, to get that money. Okay, well, how? what methods are you going to use to sell those things? All right, well, I'm going to blog, and I heard Facebook was cool, so I'm going to use Facebook. Okay, you're going to use these two things. What is your, your methodology? And so you just, instead of saying, I want to make money, and I want to make this much money, you start breaking it out to how are you going to make that money. Then, like what Sean is saying, is you create the strategic plan. And just so people know what the strategic plan looks like, it just looks like a lot of line items, right? You want to explain that part, it's Sean, actually, and then go into the... Yeah, here. Um, I have it on my desk because, you know, I have this binder here for just this purpose. So our strategic plan is broken up into eight parts, which is also eight... Uh, uh, the first one is set a goal and stick to it, which is all revenue goals. So it outlines, you know, how many of what do I need to sell in order to reach that $5,000. So if I'm selling, you know, a $1,000 product and I'm selling a $100 product in my funnel, well, I can either sell five of the thousands or if I, can, if I think I can only sell one, then I have to make up the rest of that money with the other products in my product line. And so I really just, I run the numbers until I found, find the balance of, how many of each product do I need to sell in order to reach that number? And then I go to my CMO and I say, is this an achievable number for you to sell this quarter? You know, and a lot of times it's like, you know, 10 or 11 clients per quarter, or sometimes it's eight clients per quarter, depending on the service. And he says, yeah, I can sell that. I already have this many people in the, um, this many leads that would convert to that. So the first one is all about, you know, ensure our business sells X number of X product. And then um, the next section here goes into, you know, how what do we do in our office that keeps a good morale in our business? And so it's any task, you know, like coming into work Monday through Friday and working on time and helping your team members. Those all need checklists because there's still policies you want other people to follow. You know, I'm sure with your out with your outsourcing team, good communication is very important. And so I even yeah. break down where do we communicate? We communicate in Basecamp, in our group Skype, and then through um, through email. You know, and I just put together some criteria of what I want you to follow, um, so that we for, all have for, really great. For, for example, one of those is ensure that you are replying to all team emails within 24 hours. Uh, I've had that conversation before, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, but see, like, because it's a line item, it's uh -huh. listed under all, and that means every position contract gets that line item, and now they're responsible for ensuring they do it for 24, within 24 hours. And the, and the reason we have these position contracts is at the end of the quarter, I'm going to grade you on it. And then if you're receiving a three and a half or lower, you're on probation next quarter, and if you get two three and a halfs or lowers two quarters in a row, you're most likely out. So then it eliminated that me for having to feel guilty of letting go of team members or rewarding team members that are scoring fours and fives. Mm -hmm. Because now I know they're doing everything on their position contract exactly how I want it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be scoring a four or a five. Um, so the, the second... Go ahead. What's that? It's super clear for them what's expected, and like you know, I mean, if you're not meeting the expectations, it's right there in black and white, right? It, yeah. And then because once we take the strategic plan and we break it out into position contracts, every position contract gets a packet of checklists for each line item. So then I'm pretty much handing them here's what I expect you to do in checklists. It even says in the checklist what I'm grading for. And so when I hand you your position contract, your position binder, I guess it's called, um, like you know exactly what you're responsible for each quarter. You know how to do it. And if you don't have a checklist, you create a checklist for it. And then I would go over it with you. And then at the end of the quarter, or halfway through the quarter, we grade you. You sort of grade yourself and you talk about it with me. And then I give you any feedback of, you know, how can you achieve better? on that line item by the end of the quarter and so I'm even telling you halfway through the quarter what I want by the end of the quarter mm -hmm. and then at the end of the quarter you get your grade and we talk through um, did you meet the expectations how close did you come to meeting expectations if there was something they could have done better I give them that feedback right then and so every quarter everyone grows so I love um, that yeah 
And each section, it's I can just put a link to a template to this because it breaks down. Oh, I was gonna say, when do I get my binder? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I have a blank template that I sort of follow every quarter to fill in, and I'll just add a link to the blank template so people can see a little bit more of how it breaks down into each category. Um, but once you have the strategic plan, it's pretty much your roadmap to earning your desired income that quarter. And right. then every quarter, go ahead. Uh, what's so cool about it is. You know, it, I, I, I'm just going back to all, you know, back in the days when I was a newbie and, like, I didn't understand any of this stuff and I didn't have a big <laughs> business. And, you know, now looking at all these systems that I have been taught, I now realize that I could have built my business on paper. You know, I could have built, I can design a million dollar a year, a million dollar a month business on paper. It's okay that I'm not actually making that money. But I can write out, okay, well, my goal is I'm going to make a million dollars a month. How, you know, what am I going to sell? Boom. I'm going to sell these things. And, you know, this is how many of them I'm going to need to sell to make a million dollars a month. And these are the different marketing methods that I'm going to use. And I can start actually building that business out on paper all the way down to the checklist. Even if I'm not making any money yet, I'm not doing any kind of sales, I haven't figured out how to build a website yet, I can still use pen and paper and build out the whole business and then just start you know, bit by bit working at one checklist at a time until, okay, I've figured out how to create a fan page. I'm one step closer to that million dollar a month business. Okay, now I've figured out how to do blogging. Now I've figured out how to do this. And you just work your way up through the different roles and eventually you're hiring people for roles. And I'm just, I don't know, I'm geeking out a little <laughs> bit right now, but I just think this but stuff is so cool. The techie numbers person in me wants to step in and say, not only that, but like I know over the last four quarters we've grown 30% each quarter, and so now I can just multiply out. If I continue in the same path because I'm following this system, how many more quarters is it until we're making a million dollars a quarter? You know what I'm saying? And so like you can find define your metrics that way. And then the next person who say, well, how are you tracking that you're making money? Um, we're actually we actually use what's called a pro forma, and on it, it's broken down into how we spend our money for our marketing from the strategic plan, and how we bring in our money from our strategic plan. So everything from the primary aims to the records I keep for tracking our in, our revenue and expenses, all intertwined together. Um, and so I can just you know, multiply it, you know, there's 14 more quarters until we're making a million dollars a quarter or um, different things like that. I, I'm not sure if it's actually 14, but I'm just saying um, the numbers geek inside of me, once you have it systemized or at least outlined, allows you to have that plan and sort of let yourself like remove some of the stress that's always on your shoulders because you have this extreme goal and you think it's so far away, but once you write down the plan and you say, all right, well, this is what I'm currently making doing this. If I grow 30%, I need to do this next quarter. And then that means it's going to be nine quarters until I'm making that. And so it just lets you sort of take a break from worrying about when am I going to hit my goal to how am I going to hit my goal. And that hey, I thought hey, was man, a little that's free. That's a good point. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so do we want to talk about news and tools? Or Michelle, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, let's go to news and tools. All right, cool. Yeah, you news and tools? I do. Um, <laughs> so one of my favorite apps for syndicating content, which is another system that we use, um, is Buffer App. And I think that we talked about like two or three weeks ago how they added Google Plus. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we didn't. I don't know. Anyway, they added Google Plus like two weeks ago. So you can now post to your Google Plus um, using Buffer. And then today they announced that they also do LinkedIn company pages. They were able to do your LinkedIn personal profile, which is cool. That's where most of us have our LinkedIn connections. The problem with LinkedIn um, personal profiles, number one, it's a personal profile, so you may not want, um, you know, the, the marketing manager of a company wouldn't really necessarily want to post all of the company updates on his personal profile. So a company page makes sense in a bigger organization like that. The other problem, though, is that with your LinkedIn personal profile, people can't see the updates that you post unless they are logged into LinkedIn and your connection. So it's like a firewall. On, you know, most of the internet can't see your stuff on LinkedIn. Whereas with company pages, they are visible to Google. They are visible to people who are not connected to that company. So somebody could search 
browse, find your page, find an update, and click through and, and be informed and enlightened by the wonderful content that you're posting via Buffer App. So we like Buffer App and that is why and um, they're always adding new features and it's actually one of the smoothest working um, social syndication platforms um, that that I have ever seen. Uh, when they do decide to add things, they just work. And so that's a beautiful thing about it that we also really, really love. So Buffer app, check it out and syndicate away. Very cool. All right, ladies first, Charlene, go ahead. Um, I have two. One of my most favorite apps is the Google Apps system. I installed it for our business domain and it lets us it lets everyone on the team, one, have an email address for our domain, but then also we can all share a Google Drive. So let's say Justin creates a document, it's immediately shared with the entire team, and when I search my drive, I can find documents that other people are creating. And I think, one, it keeps us virtual. I don't have to worry about, you know, my assistant's computer got a virus last, one, last week, and I didn't have to worry about what she lost on it because we store everything through our systems in Google Drive. Um, the other one I really love is JotForm. It makes it extremely easy to automate a lot of systems because once they submit a task, it sends an email to whoever you want and you can set the notifications. So, you know, Justin for proposals or me sending details to another employee, it just really helps us automate some of the systems there. So those are my two favorite tools. Awesome. Justin. Very good stuff. All right, a little bit of news. Facebook is updating. So just so everybody knows, if you haven't heard, Facebook is moving to kind of like a whole new layout. They're, they're slowly redesigning some of their post types, their sidebars. You know, they're, they're working towards a completely different layout. And so in this new layout, image posts are going to have uh, a lot more weight because they've seen the image posts have the most engagement and yada 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 so that's where they're working towards and with that said one of the updates that they just recently made was uh, to page uh, to link posts so and if you want to geek out you can read up on this stuff but basically a link post that is separate is different from a, uh, an image post an image post you have your your description and then you have your image and if you wanted to have a link in there your link is going to be above the image well previously when you made a link post that did not have an image you would put your link in there and then it would create that little preview which has a little thumbnail over on the left a little title and a description well because of the new layout they want to have bigger pictures it's now not going to be a small thumbnail to the left with a description on the right it's going to be a big picture on top and then a description just below that and the whole area is clickable so it doesn't matter if they just click on the thumbnail or the link in the post or you have this giant clicking space and I believe it's going to be huge for anybody who's using newsfeed ads anybody who's doing any kind of uh, social media marketing on Facebook having this giant clicking landing form is going to increase your CTRs also, another update. When's all that products, supposed to roll out? Do you know? It's out now. It's uh, well, the new land, the new layout is not out now, but that link post thing is out right now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, that means you're going to need to be optimizing the pictures on your posts now too, so that way when yeah. you can share them, you can have a better picture. Yeah. 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 Uh, another quick little update. Uh, all props to Mike Hill. He uh, posted this article. Uh, you now, if you go into your profile in your About Me section, there's a new section in there for professional skills. So you can associate some keywords, and really this is another way for them to target you with ads based on you know what professional, you know what you do for a living. But um, at the same time, it's also good for anybody who would be searching your profile to find out what is it that you do. So I went in there and I updated my professional skills to copywriting and advertising and whatever. But uh, just letting you know that that field is in there. And uh, if you're the type of person who needs a job or you know is recruiting things or just want to show off what you do, go uh, update your professional skills section. Napoleon Dynamite says that uh, girls only like guys that have skills, too. So something to keep in mind. <laughs> awesome episode, guys. Thank you so much, Shauna, for uh, being a guest of this episode. 
And if you guys want to continue this conversation with us, come hang out with us on Facebook. I'm over at facebook.com forward slash traffic strategist. Michelle is at facebook.com forward slash Michelle McP. That's Michelle M-A-C-P. Shauna, you're at facebook.com forward slash Shauna? Yep. You're always in my Spell it out. I, I, it's I never... C-H-A-U-N-N-A. I get to luck out. I didn't get any tourists knickknacks when I was a kid, but now every time a new social media or some profile comes out, I always get forward slash Shauna, <laughs> which awesome. is awesome. <laughs> All right, awesome. So she's at facebook.com forward slash C-H-A-U-N-N-A. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Bye. Bye. See you later.